of Acts. But I will read every part of it throughout this sermon. Let's pray. So Father, help me. Help me in no way hinder the power of Stephen's words, but to be a conduit, to be used by your Holy Spirit, to just re-say accurately what is said, to unfold and to teach, and above all, as Stephen was filled with the Spirit, would you fill us and continue to fill us in the midst of this message to the glory of your name and to the help of our souls. Amen. Israel and the Jewish people from Abraham on are no better than any other people. God did not choose Abraham because he saw, aha, that guy, he's worthy. There's a great man. He's better than anybody else. God chose Abraham because he chose Abraham. He had a purpose, a purpose from before creation. The fall would happen. And all of Genesis 1 to 11 would happen. And he had a purpose then in creating for himself out of all the peoples of the world to create a people so that through them their history would be told and they would just be the lesson book, the teaching, not only to themselves, but to all the peoples of the world that everybody's nature is sinful. That the Jew and all the non-Jews are rebellious toward the one true merciful God. To teach that the truth that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That all have been born into sin and all are under God's wrath. And Stephen drives this home in this sermon as he stands before the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin. And in it, as we go through it, there is a lesson that's not just for the Jewish leadership who is hearing this, who are in charge of the massive, beautiful temple in which they are residing at the moment, but it is for every religious people throughout the ages. And here's the lesson. Watch out. Watch out that your heart does not deceive you into thinking because I do religious things functions that I am okay with God. While doing that, your heart is hardened. You're stiff-necked and still constantly rebellious to God's mercy. And that's the second lesson as we go throughout. God's mercy keeps ringing through Stephen's sermon. God is patiently merciful to Israel, to their sin, and forgiving, and thus to us. And therefore, we are to learn the lesson to allow His warnings and His outstretched arm of mercy through Jesus Christ to bring us to repentance again and again and again. And we'll see that one of the signs of rebelliousness towards God, it would be to focus 
and to trust in one's own religious activity. To focus and to trust in religious structures and organizations and outward acts that don't flow from a humble, trusting, faith-filled heart toward God. If you know church history, then you know that what Stephen said to the Sanhedrin could very easily have been said to popes, to bishops, to clergy, and to masses of baptized persons. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. And so as we go to this sermon, remember the context Stephen was preaching to his fellow Jews and then they can't refute him because Stephen has a Scripture on his side. And then they accuse him falsely. And here's the falsehood we saw last week. Not that the temple would come down. Not that Moses would change many of the customs. But the falsehood is Stephen is against God. He's against the law. He is against this temple. Look back at verses 13 and 14 of chapter 6. They brought Stephen in now before the Sanhedrin who murdered Jesus. And it says, they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, the temple, and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And that leads us into chapter 7, verse 1. And we read, And the high priest said, Are these things so? And then Stephen answers the question with a long story. With the story of the history of rebellion in Israel. The story of their hard-heartedness that was constantly resisting God. And by the end of this sermon, it is clear that Stephen's answer to the Sanhedrin is, you Jewish leaders are the ones who are against God. You're the ones who are against the law. You're the ones who are against God's purpose in this temple. In the tradition and in the history of our people, you are the ones who persecute God's messengers. You're the ones who do not keep the law of Moses. And it is you who when God sent His own Son, much less the prophets, it is you who betrayed Him and murdered Him. You're the ones who are on trial today, Sanhedrin, not me. I'm a sinner. But Jesus circumcised my heart. And He has put away my sin. And He is the only hope for Israel. For all Jews at all times. And so as we peruse through Stephen's message, we should open our hearts to hear. First, to hear the warning. Don't be like Israel and harden your hearts. The longer you go, any of us in unrepentance, the more calloused our hearts become toward God. And that's dangerous. Secondly, as we go through it, notice His 
mercy, his patience throughout Israel's history and his patience toward us. And so as we do, let us embrace in our lives daily repentance, trust, clinging to the cross of Christ always being deeply grateful that Jesus has put away our sin by the sacrifice of himself. So let's go to it. Chapter 7, the book of Acts. This is the longest sermon that Luke records in the entire book. We pick up at verse 2. And Stephen said... Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. He was a pagan. He wasn't a Jew. Before he lived in Haran, and he said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. And then he lived in Haran. And after his father, Terah, died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. He gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And so Stephen begins his message with the beginning of Israel. The call of Abraham. That's mercy. An idol maker. A pagan. And Abraham moved and made it halfway to Canaan and ended up in Haran. And then Stephen lets us know God moved again. And got Abraham finally into the land. As he says to his fellow Jews, this land right here, Jerusalem, in the temple where all of us are standing, that was God. That was His mercy. And God gave Abraham the promise. He had no child, no natural ability to have children. He had no possession or ownership of any piece of land. But God promised He would give the land to His descendants. And Stephen is driving home the point of God's mercy towards sinners. Pick up again in verse 6. He goes on. And God spoke to this effect that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them four hundred years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, says God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And that prophecy came true. They became enslaved in the land of Egypt. And then God punished them with twelve plagues. And finally, by drowning Pharaoh's army in the sea. He continues in verse 8. And He gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob. And Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. And Jacob, his name was changed by God to Israel. One who wrestles with God. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who is Israel, has twelve Sons, we call them the twelve sons or the twelve tribes of Israel. And then Stephen goes on 
to show how Jacob's family, the 12 sons, ended up in Egypt through one of those sons, Joseph. And again, we see God's mercy because Joseph is given by God this ability to dream and to interpret dreams. And that arrogant, sinful Joseph gets boastful towards his brothers about his dreams that they will one day bow down to him and they get sinfully jealous towards God's deliverer. And they sell him into slavery. And this is the first instance of Israel Resisting God's deliverance. But in reaction, what we see throughout Israel's history and the way that Stephen lays it out is God shows mercy by making Joseph the very means to save his 11 brothers and the children of Israel that they would go on. Verse 9 and 10, And the patriarchs, Jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. And so God used the sinful rebellion of his brothers, Israel, against Joseph, which was evil. And he took that and purposed that in order to save his brothers and their families. Because they were forced finally with the famine to go to Egypt and beg their brother Joseph for food. Pick up in verse 11. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan in great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt. And he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. And then Stephen flips from the book of Genesis to the book of Exodus, jumps over 400 years, and he comes to the next deliverer. God's mercy through Moses. But as the time of the promise drew near which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dwelt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants, murdering them, so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. And as he was brought up for three months in his father's house, and when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. And so Moses grows up, and he's 40 years old. And then Stephen lets us see again the hard-heartedness of Israel in rejecting Moses. Verse 23, When he, Moses, was 40 years old, he came, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by His hand. 
but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling. And he tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? And so now Stephen shows us as they rejected Joseph, whom God, nevertheless, in his mercy, used to deliver Israel. They now reject Moses, whom God will nevertheless use to deliver Israel 40 years later. Read on. Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in the bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came a, the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare look. And then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. And then Stephen drives home again the point of the history of Israel stiff arming God. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Nevertheless, God was merciful. This man, God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. And now in the midst of Stephen's sermon, right here, he slips in Jesus of Nazareth. And that is what he's doing. Verse 37. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Stephen will conclude the sermon essentially this way. That prophet Moses spoke about, you betrayed and murdered. But back to the depths of Israel's sin in the wilderness, Stephen goes on. Verse 38. This is the one Moses, who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers, he received living oracles to give us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. God's patience 
does not go on forever. His patience came to an end for many of them. Verse 42. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, and then he quotes Amos 5, did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch, and the star of your god Rephan, the images that you made to worship. And I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Since they rejected the true God, worship of the true God, and they wanted to make with their own hands their own idols to worship, God gave them over to do just that. To worship demons. Molech. And the God Rephan. They rejected God again and again and worshiped the creation rather than the Creator. And that is the indictment of their own prophets. And what a warning for those who are children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What a privilege. And what a warning this is for all those who are fortunate enough to be raised up in God's community. The church. Christian families. And then to choose to worship worldliness. How deceptive it is to think. I'm just going to do this for a little while. Sow my wild oats. Then later I'll give my heart to the Lord. You don't know the one true God. He gave them up to hard-heartedness. Stephen lets us know he did not give up on Israel as a whole. He gave them the law, the Ten Commandments. He instructed them meticulously on how to construct the tent, the, the tabernacle, and everything that went inside of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy seat. And he laid out the priesthood and the sacrificial system. Verse 44. Our fathers, they had the tent of witness. That's the tabernacle. Had the tent of witness in the wilderness just as He who spoke to Moses directed Him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. And then he just leads us right on through. Forty years are over. Joshua leads the children of Israel into that promised land where Abraham was a sojourner. And he causes them to conquer it. And they brought the tabernacle with them. Verse, what are we? Middle 45. And this is what drives now Stephen finally to his climax, his point, that, that which is the issue of what's happening about this temple. So 
it was, that's the tabernacle coming in with the people under Joshua, so it was until the days of David. So he just jumped through over 200 years of these judges and he goes to the second king of Israel. And so it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and he asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. Not just a movable tent. And God said, no. Your hands are too bloody, David. But your son Solomon will. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. And so, 900 and something years before this sermon of Stephen's, Solomon built God's house. The temple. The massive, expensive, beautiful temple. Much more beautiful than that movable tent that they had been using for centuries. And it is the temple that these Jewish leaders that He is before at this moment while He preaches, they took so much pride in. And many of them made so much money from it. It's the temple that Jesus said He would destroy. And in three days, rebuild it. And it is the temple which Stephen now says in his sermon in verse 48, yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. And that's Stephen's main point. That's where you, my fellow Jews, totally missed it. Those holy, man-made utensils in the holy place, the candlestick and the laver, the altars of incense and with you slaughter bloody animals, the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, they had been purposefully crafted after the pattern God had shown Moses. Because they're just symbols. They are copies of the real, the spiritual, holy of holiest places, which is in God. God's presence. This is the point of the Gospel now. It is available anywhere by the person of the Holy Spirit. This is what Stephen had been teaching and preaching that dragged him here this day. Jesus is the true high priest. He is the true temple. He is the holy of holies. He's not a pointer and it flows him into you stiff-necked people. Uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Back at verse 48. Yet, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says. And then he quotes Isaiah 66. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me? Says the Lord. Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my 
hand make all these things? My hand. My hand. What kind of house will your hand build? I do not think using of the word hand in Stephen's sermon is an accident. And what I mean is this, if you go back to verse 41, while Israel is in the wilderness, he said this, they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol. And were rejoicing in the works of their hands. And then he says in verse 48, Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. See, God did tell them to build the tabernacle. He did allow Solomon to build the temple. He instituted the priesthood and the sacrificial system. Stephen has no dispute with that. Their sin is what led them to be deceived, to take pride in the works of their hands. At the core, and just read through the Gospels, and you wonder, why is it when Jesus is directly addressing Jewish leadership or self-proclaimed theologians, He is at His angriest. Because according to Jesus, they've totally missed it. And it is the deception of sin that caused Israel as a whole to take God's holy law and to turn it upside down and make it an avenue of self-exaltation and pride. That's what they did. With His commands, that's what they did with the temple and its priesthood. And that's why they're so angry. It's someone who would threaten that. See, what I just said there is exactly how the Apostle Paul described himself. Paul is there in the Sanhedrin when Stephen is preaching. And later down the road, Paul will look back to his heart and he'll say, this is what was going on in me. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4-6. to six. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh... If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. That's what blindness led to in Saul of Tarsus. The temple and the sacrifices became a means for their own religious pride. And this is what the New Testament calls the the, the very essence of the works of the law. When it takes God's pure, holy temple and His Word and His commandments and it uses them as a stepping stone to self-exaltation. 
instead of repentance and contriteness before a loving and a merciful God towards sinners. And this is the kind of religion that Jesus came to destroy. He came to suffer and to die as the sacrifice and to rise from the dead that he would construct a temple made without hands, eternal in the heavens in God. Jesus the Messiah is the only answer to that Saul who was there in the Sanhedrin that day. He is the only answer to self-deceived sinners like us. And I got a picture. I don't know at what point, but there's some point there. Saul must have just been shoving his fingers into his ears as Stephen spoke. But because Stephen was mercifully delivered, his eyes were open to see the truth of the death and the resurrection of God's Messiah, Jesus. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, therefore, he sees clearly in his final words of the sermon. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, as he just showed, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. We don't know if they cut him off or if he was done. But we know from Luke, and we'll see next week, they're fuming. And so, before we leave today, as we Christians who have fled for refuge in Jesus ponder Stephen's message, we should internalize its warnings that we not be like Israel. That's one main reason the history of Israel is in our Bibles. Concerning Israel's history and rebellion under Moses for 40 years, the Apostle Paul writes to Christians, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, these words in 1 Corinthians 10. Now, these things that he just listed happening under Moses in the wilderness, these things took place as examples for us Christians. So that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell dead in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happen to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction as Christians 
on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And the flip side of the warning is to set our gaze. That's what holy fear is. That's why God's warnings are grace and mercy. They set our gaze upon Jesus. Upon God's mercy. Upon His constant forgiveness toward those who seek Him and believe in the Gospel. Because God has sent His only Son to put away our sin by the sacrifice of Himself. Fulfilling the entire Old Covenant, Tabernacle, Temple, Sacrificial system. And thus, as believers in Jesus, we are to be vigilant to press in daily. To press into genuine communion with our Father. And we are in our lives to guard against merely going through outward motions of religiosity. To press through through to genuine heartfelt worship. Strive to enter the peaceful rest of God's unbounded mercy to every single soul who loves the Lord Jesus. Don't pretend. Don't pretend To honor the Lord by merely entering buildings. By merely singing songs. By merely cracking open the Bible. Because as Jesus said, there is a way to honor me with your lips. But to have your heart far from me. But instead, like Stephen, let us daily understand that the temple and its sacrificial system was only a pointer to the reality of God the Son who became a human being just like us, except for sin, in order to lay Himself down on that altar. Let us daily go to the reality of Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Since then, dear believer, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. That is, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and will find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your constant availability wherever we are 
in this congregation this morning and in ten thousands of congregations throughout the world, the Holy of Holies is there. It's here and there and here. And together we come trusting the gospel, knowing that as we confess our sins, you were faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For our great Savior has entered here before us, putting away our sin by the sacrifice of Himself. And so, in all the needs represented here in this congregation, in work-related, family-related, sin-related, future-related, oh, would you pour out your grace and your guidance and your leading and continue to glorify your name by causing us to walk by your Spirit. Amen.